Participate, engage, speak out, use your voice to be an effective advocate. The Voices in Advocacy podcast examines the diverse landscape of advocacy, exploring the ins and outs of building influence, driving change, and creating champion advocates. It's now time for the Voices in Advocacy podcast with your host, Roger Rickard. Hello and welcome to the Voices in Advocacy podcast. I'm Roger Rickard, president and founder of Voices in Advocacy, where we work with organizations to inspire, educate, engage, and activate your supporters by turning them into effective, influential advocates. And this is the podcast dedicated to the art of advocacy. This podcast is for the people that work and engage in advocacy efforts for their organizations, be they corporations, associations, trade organizations, and nonprofit cause groups. If you're one of the people that work to build grassroots advocacy and grow your community of advocates, then you are in the right place. Now, let's get started. In today's episode, we speak with Laura Parada, CAE, President and CEO of the American Highway Users Alliance, a nonprofit 501c6 advocacy organization serving as the united voice of the transportation community promoting safe uncongested highways and enhanced freedom of mobility now prior to running the highway users laura was the senior director of legislative affairs at the national automobile dealers association her experience also includes being a director of government relations at the american traffic safety services organization now she was named Association Friends Effective Advoc- Association Lobbyist, one of them, in 2011. Laura, thank you and welcome to today's show. Thank you, Roger. I really appreciate you having me on. I'm really looking forward to it and I know our listeners will as well. So let's roll right into the conversation. Now, The American Highway Users Alliance has been around, and this may shock some people here, has been around for almost 90 years. Why is there a need for a united voice for the transportation community? Well, thank you, Roger. That's a great question. Uh, You know, we were originally created back in 1932 by the American Petroleum Institute and General Motors because um, at the time they decided they needed better all weather roads so that the mail truck wouldn't get stuck in the mud and that you could get from point A to point B safely. And um, unfortunately, after almost 100 years, as you noted, we are still on a similar mission. You know, we still uh, need better roadways, more reliable roadways, more reliable commutes. Um, we still want to make sure your your car or truck doesn't get stuck in the mud. And uh, we just need to get from point A to point B more safely. So uh, I would say, unfortunately, after 100 years, our, our needs are almost the same, <laughs> although we have a much more vast network of roadways than we did back in 1932. Um, we still have vast amount of needs for investment in our roadways, for safety on our roadways, and uh, to relieve congestion, especially in choke points across the country for bottlenecks. You know, anyone, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the need is probably greater than it's ever been at this point. Anyone who's been in a vehicle the last 20 or 30 years knows the traffic congestion and poor road conditions are out there. So why, why has it been so hard to, to get support or to get the multi-year funding that roads and bridges need? Yeah, well, the biggest challenge is funding, obviously. That is, I think, everyone in America today, after a lot of different groups like ours making the case for the needs um, out there across the country for our roads and bridges, which, you know, it's it's us, but with a combination of many other stakeholders all working with a similar sing- song sheet, uh, you know, there definitely is a awareness out there for the general American, for the um for businesses, for Congress, that there's a need to invest. We have a $786.4 billion backlog of road and bridge investment needs, according. Say that number again. Oh, sure. (laughs) Sure. $786.4 billion investment need 
of, for roads and bridges, according to the US DOT conditions and performance report. So just absolutely mind boggling figure, you know, almost a trillion dollars. And it's, um, so we, we have made the case and I do think there's general awareness, which is great, but the biggest challenge is finding the funding to do it. As we all know, um, well, maybe not everyone knows, there's something that uh, funds our federal roadways called the Highway Trust Fund. And as a roadway user, when you fill up at the gas pump, um, you're paying into that federal highway trust fund uh, to fix our roads and bridges. Um, but unfortunately, that fuel tax that you pay at the pump hasn't been increased since 1993. So that's quite a long time. And road construction continues to become more expensive over time due to inflation. Uh, and we haven't been shoring that trust fund up to make sure we have the money we need to make the investments. So it's a matter of the world knowing right now in the US that we need to invest in our roadways, but a lag between that and the political will to increase the user fees to allow us to ramp up investment. And I think the, the average consumer probably doesn't think about the fact that A, there's a greater need, B, over all these years, the costs to repair or build new uh, have continued to go up just like everything else goes up uh, in an inflationary world. And then you have on top of that better gas mileage, more electric vehicles, more hybrid vehicles. And so when the quote unquote gas guzzler of yesteryear uh, paid in for every single gallon of gas to that trust fund, uh, the number, I would say, precipitately drops because of the fact that now instead of getting eight miles or 10 miles to a gallon, they may be getting 30 or 40 miles to a gallon and, or none at all. Uh, and yet they're still using the product. They're still using the highways and the bridges. So with that, who do you actually represent within the alliance? And how does that work? Uh, and I know you partially uh, uh, explain this, but how does that work to really help all Americans? Sure. So our biggest strength is a coalition. And that is an important nuance to make. We're a coalition. We're not a trade association. We're not you know, a professional advocacy association. So we are made up of trade associations and companies across the country who um, care passionately about transportation investment and safety and congestion relief. So our members come from a variety of stake, stakeholder sectors, including the traditional kind of road builder type um, organizations and companies, but then also material suppliers. So, you know, your, your asphalt and concrete folks, we have the motorcycle industry who are members, the, the, so the motorcycle riders, the uh, trucking industry. So the folks who are out there, you know, driving your goods to market every single day, um, you know, both the bigger fleets and also the independent drivers are members as well. Uh, AAA clubs, um, in addition, actually the energy industry, the automakers, and uh, really, it's it's a broad membership, it really is. And that um, really lends to our strength of our voice because the more people you have engaged, the stronger the voice is and the more that Congress listens. Yeah, and the diversity of that voice from not only uh, the trade side, but the business side, as well as the association side, all coming together. And I, I think I saw that you have an associated general contractors, you have the motor coach industry, you, you mentioned the trucking industry, the motorcycles. So yes, it, it is a little bit diverse. And, and it, I, I recall a few years back working with uh, uh, one of the chapters of the Associated General Contractors and them pointing out that bicycle groups that want to have their extra lane as part of the highway build don't pay any money because it's not part of the highway trust fund because of, of the tax that goes on the gasoline. So how do you rectify what those problems are? How do, how do legislators rectify those problems? Do you see that uh, coming up, particularly at the state levels? Oh, yes, definitely. And at, at the federal level, too, as we're debating the next transportation authorization, um, you know, more and more, 
folks want to take money out of the highway trust fund for various things, you know, whether, whether it's um, trails or, or bike lanes or, um, you know, um, common, keeping common areas nice on the highway, you know, all these things, transportation enhancements, we call them. Uh, but then again, when you're, they're not paying into the trust fund, there's a struggle and a debate. You know, we have limited resources and more and more folks want to come to that highway trust fund trough to have a drink. <laughs> and There's just so much to go around. So it's a, it's a constant um, debate and the pendulum swings too with Congress, you know, um, depending on who's in power and who's controlling the House and the Senate and the administration, there are different priorities for each Congress. And the pendulum continues to swing on transportation, just like everything else in the world of politics in the United States. Well, it's a bit, and, and I don't know that I remember this correctly, so I'm sure you will be able to, to advise the listeners here. But didn't it used to be that when you would reauthorize transportation funding, it usually came in like seven year cycles? Was, was, was that correct? Or something along that line? And now, even when there's been any money allocated, it's only been kind of short term, one year at a time more of uh, duct tape and band-aids to get us through. Is that correct or am I off? You're, you're correct. Unfortunately, um, yeah, it used to be historically, we'd always have a five-year reauthorization five was, was the, the cycle. Um, but all that changed in 2008 when the Highway Trust Fund first ran out of money. Um, so that was the first time that Congress started spending more money out of the trust fund than we were bringing in via the, and I should add, there's more than just the fuel taxes that fund the trust fund. We also have a heavy vehicle use tax and a federal excise tax on heavy duty trucks and a tire tax. So there are various taxes that pay in. And But in 2008, it was the first year that they authorized to spend more than they brought in. And that caused the insolvency and the first general fund transfer. So over time, you know, they continue to have to do these general fund transfers because uh, they haven't decided on things like, are they going to actually increase the gasoline or diesel tax? They just hit, Congress has not been able to come to that decision. So instead, they've done general fund transfers, and that's led to a lot of extensions of policy rather than going to the five-year bill. Um, you know, with, with one of the last authorizations a few years ago, there was something like, I think it was 22 extensions or something like that of, of the authorization. I mean, it was insane. But um Right now, we're living under an extension right now, the FAST Act, the last transportation authorization that was passed, that was a five-year bill, um, expired on September 30th of 2020. And Congress did come together in a bipartisan fashion and agreed to give a one-year extension due to the pandemic and all these other factors that were going on. So right now, we're in a one-year extension of the FAST Act to September 30th, 2021. So again, this is a panic moment for all the uh, transportation stakeholders that we only have till September 30th to try and get this long-term bill passed again before we have to face another extension, which is the last thing any of us want. Yeah, and it's it's the kick the can down, down the road philosophy, literally down the, this road uh, philosophy. So with your diverse alliance of, of different members, how do you use them or how, how do they come together to help advocate for this? Because one of the challenges, the more diverse an alliance or coalition gets, the more it's easy to carve off and say, well, I can't support that because of, of this little minute thing rather than looking at holistically the big picture. So how, how do you keep that working and roll it, rowing in the right direction? And that's a great question too. Um, you know, we try and keep our priorities at 30,000 foot level. You know, I mean, that's the way we have to do it with such a diverse group of, of members from different sectors. We really um, try and uh, make sure it's a collaborative process where everyone gets a say in where we're going and that we're very clear about what we stand for. And um, we really try and keep our policies broad. I mean, number one, we want a robust long-term transportation authorization that's bipartisan that um, you know, also will address the problems with the highway trust fund. So really trying to keep our policies a uh, very 30,000 foot level and um, things that all our members can agree on because there's a lot that they can disagree on and a lot of um, fights over particular issues and that's okay, but everyone in our organization tries to leave that at the door when we come to a board meeting or to our policy and government affairs committee meetings and say, all right, I can check all these other things that we're fighting over, but we can all agree on these big things. And, and that's how we get things done. 
you're on top of all the details. You're on top of the sausage making. You're on top of what, what's happening in Congress and how it's moving and when things are going to take place. So what tools do you use to help keep the Alliance members as educated and engaged as they need to be? Well, I think the biggest thing for me is constant communication, you know, just constantly staying in front of our members. I mean, first of all, we're, you know, still in a pandemic, so you got to show some member value here and they have to see what they're getting for their investment in the highway users. So I just kind of try and over communicate so that they know what we're doing for them every day and how they can engage because they don't just want to send us a check. They also want to actually participate in the process, which is extremely important. And they want to know where their money's going. Yeah. Exactly. So th- some of the things um, since the pandemic hit and I was new as a CEO, my first CEO gig and then a pandemic and being new to the highway users, it was a triple whammy there. Um, so one of the things we did was we uh, created a new driving forward newsletter so that we could communicate with our members every other week and just explain what are we doing for them on and off the hill. You know, letters we've signed, um, big meetings we've held, uh, you know, maybe linking to presentations I did or podcasts I've done. So things like that, just so they can see how we're getting their message out. Also uh, having regular policy and government affairs committee meetings where we're bringing together our members and hearing directly from them on on what's keeping them up. What do they need help on? How can we all work together on things? Um, How can we have success with transportation authorization? And then finally, you know, really also ramping up our social media presence, which was something that the highway users had. And over time, it kind of fizzled with different staff coming and going. And I just came in and saw a little bit of a void there and said, there's a lot we could be doing to communicate not only with our members, but also with the public and the Hill that we weren't tapping into. Wow. You've got a nice diverse list there. And uh, and, and surviving the triple whammy. Uh, uh, of the pandemic had, had to be very difficult. How long do you, uh, how often do you get your policy committees together? Is it once a month, a quarterly, or how often do they get together to be able to share the things that you just brought up? It depends. You know, when things are moving, they have to meet more regularly. You know, last year when things were really ramping up, they were, um, you know, meeting monthly or a couple times a month. Um, that's going to be coming into fruition again. Even at the end of 2020, we had to meet quite often because we were putting together policy priorities for this Congress. So it just, it's kind of ebbs and flows depending on what's going on. And, um, but then that being said, I try and communicate even more than just when we have a meeting. Um, I probably send at least weekly emails to the group saying, here's a new study that came out on, you know, impacts of COVID on transportation, or, you know, here is some intelligence I picked up on when the markup's going to happen in the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee um, this year or this month, you know, so just trying to bring intelligence, bringing new studies and educational information. And, um, and then we've also been doing a slew of events with the, with the Policy and Government Affairs Committee this year um, with meet and greets. Since it was a new Congress, we decided, well, why don't we introduce them to the new members of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee in particular? I think we've had about 18 meet and greets uh, this, this spring um, with, me- with new members of Congress, both the Democrats and Republicans, um, where you know we are setting the meeting up for them. They're, they just get a Zoom link and can come in and talk a little bit about their organization. And then we can have a broad conversation on the transportation authorization. So, you know, just trying to find different ways that we can connect with our members, different ways that our members can connect with Congress and um, different ways that we can move the needle. Yeah. You know, it, it reminds me of the importance of that communication as you were talking about meeting with with new members and everything else. It reminds me that uh, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania and in fact, central Pennsylvania, which actually had the chair of the transportation committee for many years within the same family. It was originally uh, Bud Schuster who represented that district who was the chair of the transportation committee. And then his son, Bill took over the seat and then he chaired it up until uh, this uh, new Congress. So, uh, and, and I understood the, the value of being a chair of a transportation committee because of what, uh, what happened to fall in place in that congressional district. So you talked about wanting to get, getting together more because of uh, working on your initiatives. I would assume, 
and I don't want to do that, but I would assume that you are at least in support of some of the Biden administration infrastructure package uh, along the way. And if, and if I'm incorrect, correct me there. What are some of the other one or two top line initiatives that you've uh, all agreed on for the Alliance the next uh, 12 months? So yes, um, you know, the American Jobs Plan is extremely important and that's stimulus money, which is fantastic. Um, this is all very confusing. I don't want to get your listeners confused, but you know, there's kind of two paths going on. We have the traditional reauthorization process that's proceeding, and then we have this stimulus effort by the president that's supposed to be funding on top of what the transportation authorization does. So um, we're extremely supportive of the increase in highway and bridge investment that the president is um, proposing through the American Jobs Plan. It's fantastic. It would be very much needed relief at a very critical time because not only did the Federal Highway Trust Fund get hit by um, by pandemic by the pandemic and decreased vehicle miles traveled in 2020, but all the different state coffers who have their own various fuel taxes on them um, to to create state funding for their state transportation systems were hit similarly, and each state was hit in different ways, just depending on how they're they're set up or the trust fund is. And so, um, you know, having that stimulus, additional road and bridge money is critical, absolutely critical to make sure that roadway projects can continue, especially until this new transportation authorization is signed into law, um, so that can, projects that were scheduled can continue through this construction season. And then also, um, one of the other things we're very supportive in the American Jobs Plan was the uptick in investment for roadway safety. They were calling for $20 billion in additional money for highway safety, in particular, $8 billion for the Highway Safety Improvement Program, which goes to all the infrastructure safety pro program projects across the country, things like putting in cable barrier or rumble strips or pavement markings to make sure that the roadway is more forgiving for the driver. That's something we're passionately supportive of. So saying $20 billion, I mean, sounds like a lot of money, but for historic safety um, infrastructure programs, saying another $8 billion for infrastructure safety is, is a significant increase. So we're extremely excited about that. And well, um, we're, we're just anxious to see how it all plays out. That, that's great news because uh, I don't think people... Uh, take the time to think through the fact that because they weren't traveling anywhere and because the roads weren't used as much, thus all of the funding vehicles that are pretty much based on usage, uh, all, that, all those funds at every level of government shrank and shrank sizably uh, because it, you know, if you live in any type of dense population area, you saw how dramatic the transportation changed with the number of people on the on, on the highways at that time. So it is vitally important. I'm glad you brought that up because I think it is important that people recognize what the differences of those are. Uh, this is probably a silly question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask any. Are you seeking any additional stakeholders to help join the alliance in, in these battles? Oh, yes, definitely. We actually, um, as a new CEO last year, um, our board went through a strategic planning process. And definitely one of the top priorities is to grow our membership because our board realized, as we all know, strength in numbers and the more um, diverse stakeholders we can get and broad stakeholders we can get to join, the stronger we are as an organization and our bigger our reputation is on the hill. So that is absolutely vitally important to us. And I'm putting a lot of time and energy to try and open new doors um, to new stakeholders. You know, um, for example, just one new, new market I've been really talking to a lot is the autonomous vehicles market. You know, trying to find new folks who are gonna be using the roadway because you know, we always are focused on who's using our roadways and um, trying to open a door into to new avenues of folks that you know, maybe didn't know about our organization before or why it could be beneficial to them. So yes, we're in, a, in the middle of a big membership push. And um, if you use the roadway and you care about the roadway, uh, you know, we're happy to talk to you about membership at any time. And you can find out more about our, our, um, our organization at info at highways.org. Perfect, perfect. 
Uh, you talked about coming in and having the three whammies as being uh, the CEO when you first walked in the door uh, with the Alliance. Running an advocacy organization can be hard. And anybody that's been around them will second that uh, sentiment. What are your biggest challenges? Is it time, staff bandwidth, money, all the above, something else? Share with us the hardest challenges. You know, the hardest challenges. Um definitely the pandemic and what it's done to the budget. You know, there have been members who were longtime members who couldn't, you know, give what they used to give. And then because of that, I, I couldn't um, replace a position when someone, luckily I didn't have to let someone go, but someone had moved on to a new opportunity and I chose this time not to fill their position, you know? So it's, it's um, I'm trying to be a good steward of the resources we have. And um, so I think it's just time and money <laughs> are the biggest challenges. Aren't those two always the answer to everything? It's always time or money. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It. And, it, and it becomes a balancing act. And, and uh, those priorities have to shift. So I'm going to take you down a different path now or, uh, or, or a sidebar here. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of advocacy? Relationships is definitely the first thing that comes to my mind. I am... Um, you know, one of my mentors when I was right off the hill um, taught me the value of building relationships to get, you know, your goals achieved on Capitol Hill. And um, it really stuck with me, you know, so I try to treat every single person I meet, you know, whether it's um, at a stakeholder organization or on the hill, like they might be the chief of staff someday because I've been around long enough to know that that happens quite often. The scheduler becomes the chief of staff and the staff assistant becomes the chief of staff and the chief of staff becomes a member of Congress. So I think it's always trying to put your best foot forward, um, being friendly, gracious, um, giving everyone the time of day that they deserve and uh, trying to make them know that you're an honest broker and that you're gonna do what you say you're gonna do. Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's, and it's also, you never know who knows who, who knows who. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, it, 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 become, it becomes a funny thing. I will, I will share, without, without giving away an identity, um, a very, very, very well-known uh, former U.S. senator uh, became a very close contact because our sons played hockey together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I happened to be in D.C. and walking the halls and that person saw me, it was like a shock. How come you're not coming to see me? Mm -hmm. I didn't want to take up their very busy, valuable time. But that tells you that the power of relationships and you have no idea. It could be somebody that you went to church with. It could be somebody's cousin, aunt, uncle, brother. I mean, one has no clue where these connections come from. And it is building relationships, but I also think it's probably honest relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and and really following up and drilling a little bit deeper with with people. So that comes into if you're building those relationships, if you're making those contacts, and you're doing everything else. How can organizations and alliances, coalitions, and advocacy groups? Uh, and their advocates move any legislation forward in such a polarized, divided Congress and country. Yes. Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer in trying to do everything bipartisan. Uh, I really always tried to build relationships on both sides of the aisle uh, and really tried, if, if it's at all possible before moving forward on anything, try and make it bipartisan. Uh, because as we know, this pendulum keeps swinging and it's swinging rapidly and it's swinging far. And um, it's the only way to really get anything done in the long term. Because, um, yeah, maybe if you're very one sided on something, you can get a lot done in one Congress. But then the very next Congress, if, if the powers that be change completely, you're lost and you're lost until the next time it flips again. So I just really think there's such value in bipartisanship. America wants bipartisanship. A lot of, I think a lot of America does. I think a lot of America is frustrated with what they've seen um, over the years. So 
I don't know. All I can say is just continue to try and reach across the aisle and push Congress to reach across the aisle because otherwise you're not going to have a lot of success, unfortunately, except for maybe a couple of years here and there. <laughs> and, you know, people that might be listening that are outside of uh, being inside advocacy efforts and government affairs and public policy don't realize the high percentage of pieces of legislation that are bipartisan. The only thing they ever hear of are the ones that aren't. And the ones that are complex and the ones that, uh, that require um, a lot of negotiation. So uh, I think it was a great answer. And I think you're absolutely spot on uh, with, with that opinion and that we as a country want to move forward and be a little bit more in the bipartisan uh, uh, aspect of things. Laura, this has been great today. Any final thoughts or anything you'd like to add? You know, I just appreciate the opportunity to do this, Roger. I think um, I would just encourage people if you're listening and if you want to get engaged, that there are so many avenues to do it. You know, whether it's if you want to get to know your legislator, having a site visit back home, if you have a company or if you have an association, inviting them to see and meet your employees. There are just so many ways that people can get involved. And a lot of folks just are fearful of the unknown and decide not to. So I would just encourage folks to, to get engaged, get involved. If you want to learn more about how you can engage with the highway users, we'd, we'd welcome um, engagement. You can you know check out our website at highways.org or email us at info at highways.org. Org. And um, I just think there's a lot of great things we could do together to advance the, the nation. And a lot of it does start out there on our roadways, whether it's reducing fatalities and serious injuries so that our loved ones can get home safely or so that your Amazon package can get there faster or your groceries can get delivered to your doorstep safely and quickly. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks that are using the roadways and they aren't thinking about it every day, but it's definitely not free. Um, you know, you pay for your cell phone, you pay for your cable, you pay for um, your car, but unfortunately you have to pay for your roadways too. <laughs> well, and great examples of how it impacts everyday Americans every day in every single way. If we can't get goods and services or ourselves from point A to point B safely and timely, then it costs us all in time and treasure. Exactly. So I, I couldn't agree more, Laura. This has been great. What a great guest. What a great representative of the Highway Users Alliance in Laura. That wraps up our conversation today. Remember, this was Laura Parada, CAE, President and CEO of the American Highway Users Alliance. Thank you, Laura, for being on the show today. Thank you, Roger. Have a great day. Now it's time for the advocacy engagement tip. We always talk about having our advocates communicate with their elected officials. And to be effective in doing this, one has to learn a few guiding principles. Today's principle is show respect. There's always more than one side to a story. Although you may disagree with the policymaker's position on an issue, you can still communicate an understanding of their point of view. To gain respect, one must demonstrate it by taking the time to understand the issues. Put yourself in their shoes. Do you have a program to train and onboard any new advocates or reinforce advocacy best principles and practices to your existing grassroots advocates? We're proud to have RAP Index as a sponsor to the show. Let's face it, today's advocacy arena is just plain noisy. Organizations are stretched. You need every advantage to make sure your issue gets the attention it deserves and your voice heard. The RAP Index is the best way to do just that by finding your stakeholders' relationships and engagement power. Get past the noise. Know who your people know. Go to rapindex.com, that's R-A-P index.com, and tell them Roger sent you for a special offer. A few quick notes to end this episode. 
In upcoming episodes, you will be treated to great interviews from leaders in the world of politics, associations, and nonprofit causes. If you like today's podcast, head over to where you find your podcasts and subscribe to the Voices in Advocacy podcast today. A big thank you to today's distinguished guest. We at Voices in Advocacy work with organizations to inspire, educate, engage, and activate your supporters by turning them into effective, influential advocates. That's it for this episode of Voices in Advocacy. Remember, you have the power to be an effective, influential advocate. Now go out and make it a better world. We hope you enjoyed today's Voices in Advocacy podcast and look forward to you joining us again next week. To learn more about Voices in Advocacy, go to our website, voicesinadvocacy.com.